All right, so let's do the hard part. Access to this webinar for educational and informational purposes only consult a licensed broker registered investment advisor before placing any trades. All securities and orders attract and discuss are attracted and monitored in virtual trading accounts. Virtual account prices and returns made for magical trading goals. Commission costs are excluded. Neither full stock or .com, PSW, no affiliates, nor any of their respective offices, personnel, representative agents, or independent contractors. Are in such capacities licensed financial advisors, registered investment advisors, or registered broker dealers. Nothing in these webinar websites, promotion, care, constitutes promotion, recommendation, solicitation, or offer of any particular investment, security, or transaction. Trading options involves risk. Visit the OCC website, www.optionscreening.com, to read the characteristics and standardized options. PSW provides education and trading services that are meant to teach you the risk and potential rewards of trading options. And we are not a service that tells you what to trade. We are not blind guaranteeing any profit. As always, do not trade with money you cannot afford to lose. Past performance does not equal future results. And these results discussed in this webinar are not typically are only valid on that specific or identified date. Your results may vary. By accessing this webinar, you agree to hold the above harmless many losses you may incur as a result of the information discussed in the media identified above. By accessing this webinar, you agree to be placed on our mailing list and receive our newsletter. Rest assured we take your privacy very seriously. We will not distribute this your information on anyone. Uh, okay. <clears throat> now, where was I? Now, see, I do that, I'm not in the mood to talk anymore. All right. I don't understand why the computer can't read it. We used to have a computer thing that read it, and then. Um, apparently, on this new computer, it cancels out the sound of the computer. Like it, it's like if the computer reads something, you guys can't hear it, which is insane. And I don't know how to make it not do that. I mean, I guess it's good for like eliminating background noise and stuff like that, but so crazy. So, anywho, um, what's going on? Not much is going on. Let's see, where's our futures? We're just sort of chugging along down a bit, but nothing, nothing major. And you know, rattling around. So we're holding some of these lines. It's okay. We're holding that. You know, nothing, nothing exciting really. Europe's down, they finish down. You know, and they, but in the bigger picture, you know, go ahead, zoom out to days. It's like we're still obviously moving up. You want to watch the Russell closely. Um, if he breaks down, this 1550 line is very critical. If he breaks below that 1550 line, though, these guys will probably start curling down, too. So, you know, so far it's been holding up, but it's not exciting the way it's holding up. Um, the VIX must, must have rolled over eh, to the new contract because it certainly didn't kick up that much for no reason. Oil took a spill. Down from 60 to below 57.50 now. Brent failed 65. Gasoline failed to hold 190. Uh, natural gas even fell after yesterday's nice run. We, we picked it up here yesterday. So that we, when I wasn't yesterday, what were we doing yesterday? We had it, we picked up here yesterday and a little bit of a bounce, but it wasn't. Then, then it kind of all fell apart anyway. Same with oil. We we played oil. We played gasoline. You know, we played all these guys at the lows here. Picked them up, had a nice run, but then it all collapsed. I'm sorry, it was yesterday. <laughs> we were, what did we do? I don't know. It's like yesterday. I remember 190 something on gasoline. I don't know. Right away, right about we picked it up here on gasoline. I forgot where it was actually in chat. But we got a little bit of oil and it was made a couple of pennies and then the whole thing fell apart the next day. But we weren't playing the next day, so we don't really care. What is this? The page requesting requires membership. I am a member. How dare you? <laughs> All right. So it doesn't matter what we did yesterday. Let's talk about what we're doing today. So today, uh, same thing that we're looking at the S&P. It's like way up. 2750 to 3000 is basically a 10% move, you know, that's that's 10% off the line. And uh and we would expect to have if you're having a 10% move up, then your pullback should be 2% back. And uh, that's a weak retrace and then 4% is a strong retrace. So how much is it? Well, we're up from say 250 points so your retraces are going to be 50 points 
which brings you down to somewhere between the 50 and 75 range. Because you say, should it be 50 points from 25 or should it be 50 points from uh, from from 20 from 3,000 even? But really, technically, it's from 3,000 even. So we're going to look for 2950 to be some kind of pullback. And then if it if it bounces off that and heads back up, though, that's going to be real bullish. Um, if it fails that, then we'd be looking at the next 50 down, which is the 2900 line. And if that fails, then we're going all then we're all the way back here. So we'll see what happens. Um, da, 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 da. Um, this is the, this is what bothers me though. See, this is um, and John Lee posted this chart this morning. The the change in income for the S and P five hundred. Forget individual stocks and whatever. And as, and as I mentioned a couple of articles ago, um, there's just 70 stocks that are driving the entire global, not, not just our market, there's 70 stocks driving the entire global market. And that they're accounting for 100% of the gains in the entire global market. The other thousands and thousands of stocks are not really doing that well. But the indexes are going higher because of certain high performing companies like Netflix and Amazon and things like that, they're just getting, you know, the, the trillion dollar companies, Apple too. I mean, you know, Apple might deserve to be a trillion dollar company, but that doesn't mean it's not driving the markets uh, and taking everything with it. Because they have, these guys have heavy weightings in the indexes and they're gathering up more and more and more cash and people are putting more and more money in it. And, and, and yes, because to me, Microsoft seems safer than most things you're going to put your money into. Apple seems safer than most things you're going to put your money into. We just went into Intel. We love IBM. So we're not any different than, than the people who are putting all their money into it around the world. We're, we're causing this gigantic, uh, massive upswing in the market. But it, it's an indexing problem. It's a problem that... <clears throat> that the indexes have become so concentrated that it only takes a few stocks doing well to move the entire index up, no matter what the rest of the stocks are doing. You know, and what you're looking at here is that the total earnings for the S&P 500, including the, the monster stocks, are actually going lower. They were lower last quarter, and they're going to be even lower this quarter. And that's lower and then lower than this. So, you know, here's, here's minus you know, 2%, minus 1%, this is 3%, but in total, it's 5% lower than it was at the end of this quarter. These aren't, these aren't like, uh, you know, this isn't your total, this is what it is for this quarter compared to last quarter. So, you know, yeah, I mean, on the one hand, okay, so what, a little, it's the same as the chart though, a little pullback in earnings, okay? Earnings go goo 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 up, 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 and you have a little pullback in earnings, mostly caused by um, the rising oil prices hit a lot of people in the first quarter, the second quarter. That's easing off a little bit. You've got wages going up everywhere. Fifteen dollar, you know, fifteen dollar minimum wages are kicking in around the country. Uh, even people who aren't getting a fifteen dollar minimum wage is still, you know, even if it's not legislated. It's still being pushed around. Um, even uh, you know, even Walmart and stuff is raising people's wages. Um, so a lot of companies are voluntarily pushing entry level jobs up to fifteen dollars an hour, and and it takes time, but that trickles up, you know, so everybody gets it. Because you know, if the guy, if you're a twenty five thousand dollar a year secretary. And uh, all of a sudden, the guy cleaning the floors is getting twenty five, twenty eight thousand dollars, whatever. You are going to complain to your boss, right? You're going to say, "Hey, you know, I think I deserve a raise too." So that it takes time for that action to come, and especially because um, uh, millennials, I guess they're called millennials. I don't, I don't know. I guess I don't know what the hell these people are called. Millennials are people born around the millennium, I think. I don't know. Um, anyway. So those people who are the young job people now are, um, they, they're not, they're, they're not um, trained to ask for raises. When I was a kid, you got a raise all the time. I, that was how, that's how wages worked. You worked for someone, if you worked for them, so if you worked for them through Christmas, you expected a bonus. And if you kept working for them in January 1st, you expected to get a raise for the next year. 
Every year we expected a bonus and we expected a raise. It's like if, you, if I'm still here next year, then you must like me and therefore I deserve a raise. And you know why? Because we could just quit and get another job in five minutes. No matter what job you had, you could pretty much walk out and get another job. There's even a song, take this job and shove it. <laughs> um, that, so, so basically, if you weren't getting paid well, if you weren't getting, not even paid well, it doesn't matter, whatever you start at, you would expect your raise. Um, and, and they had to compete for workers. So uh, that was good. That was good for the workers. It was good for people. That's how come we had more and more money, and that's how we ended up having a housing bubble, because everybody could afford stuff, and we were buying houses. Um, the kids today don't even get that concept. They, they came up in a job market where you're lucky to have a job, where, where you're lucky you found a job, where, where many companies in, in the last recession 10 years ago, so when these millennials were first entering the job market, the first group of them were entering the job market, or the, the example they saw and what they saw from their parents is like, holy shit, you're lucky you have a job. You're lucky you're getting paid. You're lucky they didn't cut your medical benefits. You're lucky this and that. So they're not trained to ask for, for raises. So it's a very, very slow trickle as wages rise before they really go through the economy because the younger workers are not trained to ask for, work, for, for raises. The older workers are just uh, happy they're still working, really. Um, it's, there's not that many people who are really aggressively going to go to their bosses and ask for money. And the unions are dead, of course. So um, it's, it's a lot slower this time around to see wages pushing the economy. But there's a physical fact that when you have barely any unemployment at all, um, that, that wages are going to go up. It's a supply and demand thing. There are not enough workers for the jobs that are out there. So as companies start hiring, and, 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 and right now this economy is in a very, very slow move uh, upward. But if, it's, if we actually appreciate the Fed does start lowering rates, and, uh, and the government provides stimulus and we do infrastructure and we look to hire a million people for infrastructure projects, where the hell are a million people? We don't have a million people sitting around doing nothing. You know, so, so you end up competing and then the government starts competing for workers and everybody's competing for workers. Um, that's going to drive wages up. And everybody, and, and, and you know, the fear of robots is out there. Everybody's worried, and they will. Eventually robots will take all the jobs, but not now. Look at self-driving cars. They talk about it constantly, but the reality is there's no self-driving cars really on the road. They're certainly not being sold to consumers, and they won't be for a few more years. It takes a long time before that. Um, you know, certain things like kiosks can replace fast food order people to a certain extent, uh, things like that. But a robot is still a robot, and, and they're not perfect by any stretch. So. Uh, there's, they, you have to have people monitoring them and so on and so forth. So we're not, you know, the, the real transition is many, many years away before it's actually clearly better to have a robot than a person. But again, that's one of the problems when you have these, um, you know, you're getting wage pressure and you have low unemployment is a robot is a little more attractive than some of the people who end up applying for jobs at low wage jobs. You know, it's like, yeah, the robot might be stupid, but have you seen the people who are applying? <laughs> it's because that's what happens. By the way, that is one of the limits on economic expansion. Is you run out of people, you run out of qualified workers, and everything starts slowing down. Like if you go to uh, McDonald's or any fast food place now, um, you're not being served by people who have college degrees anymore. You're being uh, served by high school dropouts. Um, the people who were the people who had college degrees who were working at McDonald's, which was a, a staple of the, the recession like ten years ago, they were working real jobs now. They've all they've all moved on and up. And and the people who are working at McDonald's are back to being the entry level people. That's fine. I mean, when I was a uh, when I was in high school, my friend managed at McDonald's. I, for one of my friends, managed at McDonald's. That was his job. Uh, he was in charge of the entire store. It was a huge operation with like dozens of workers. He, he was he was the boss. Um, he didn't own it. He actually just earned, you know, he worked his way up. He started when he was like 15, and by the time he was 17, he's in charge. So, 
you know, and that it wasn't terrible, but I, I remember the kind of people, because again, it was like when I was when I was that age, there was very low unemployment. And um the the people he would try to get when he would tell me stories trying to hire people, it was a nightmare. I mean, and, and you know, you get you, you get the you really scrape the bottom of the barrel when you have low unemployment, and that and that slows everything down. It slows down all the performance. Even you, you try to go get lunch and you spend 10 extra minutes in line because the people behind the counter are slow, that's slowing your productivity down. It's not, not because you're not productive. You can be super productive, but if you have to stand in line at Starbucks for 25 minutes waiting for a freaking coffee, that's a problem. But all the, all the super fast baristas got better jobs, you know, and now, now we have the slower baristas and you have the slower people at McDonald's and stuff like that. So it's all cycles. That's why you have economic cycles. There's no perfect way to get through this stuff. Um, and, and, but the problem is people are very unrealistic when they look at expansions and look at market uh, run-ups and they think that this is never going to happen. They, they think this doesn't matter. It does matter. This is a sign that you're reaching the uh, the end of the expansion cycle. You can't just keep making more and more money. We've squeezed and squeezed and squeezed, and we got up to here, and we maxed out here because of the tax cuts. But now, what, what are you going to do for an encore? You can't cut taxes any lower. Corporations don't pay any freaking taxes now. So you can't cut taxes any lower. Out of out of three point five trillion dollars collected by the government, corporations paid about three hundred million. I mean, three hundred billion in taxes. Not even ten percent of the of the total tax revenue comes from corporations. So they don't, they already paid no taxes effectively, and um, and they've already they already pay the workers as little as possible. They can't pay them less. They can't take away any benefits. There are no more benefits. So obviously their margins are gonna get squeezed unless they can raise prices and they can't raise prices because the consumers are stretched. But with the consumers, the employees that they're not paying. You know, something's gotta give. And the thing that has to give, by the way, it's already given, the consumers have already maxed out their credit again. I talked about that yesterday. So the the something that's gotta give is not the is not the consumers can't stretch their credit any further. They've hit their limit again. So the only thing left to give is corporations to give better wages to the employees and kick off a cycle where the employees can afford to buy more stuff. And that, that's where we're kind of at now. We need to be at that point. We're not there yet. So, you know, it's not terrible when you see the margin squeezing, but on the other hand, it's, it's not obviously not going to be something the market's going to like if they wake up and pay attention to it at some point. Nobody has any comments or questions. Fantastic. Hopefully I'm still talking to actual people. <laughs> All right. So what else has happened? Um, oh, yeah, we talked about the portfolio this morning. Um, oh, I said we're going to re review the short-term portfolio. We're going to doing the options opportunity portfolio. We looked at the money talk portfolio in the morning post, and um, the money talk, talk portfolio is doing very nicely. It's, it's only been 18 months. Uh, we started all these portfolios January of last year. Um, Actually, the money tour might be a little bit older. I might get that back here. Hang on. Let's find out. Do, 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 do. Portfolios. Very slow. Money talk. There it is. September. September of 2000. Actually, it's almost two years. I call it two years old. And it's at 171 now. And what was it this morning? This morning it was 173, so it's going down a little bit. Um, anyway, the, I mean, the cool thing about the money tour portfolio is that um, is that we don't really touch it. You know, in other words, I go on uh, on the show Money Talk once a quarter, basically. And uh, in fact, they just uh, texted me and said we well, got to make an arrangement for August to come on. Um, so I come on once a quarter. And we pick generally two stocks each time I'm on the show. I add two new stocks. We've only really made an adjustment. I think one time was LB. LB did uh, very poorly out the out the gate, so we uh, increased our stake in LB. Uh, you know, and that's not the only one that we actually changed. All the rest have been exactly as we as we set them up. When 
when we did the shows. And we, we've, I think we cashed in a couple maybe, but we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So in, in just in, in, in a little less than two years, we picked 10 total stocks. And, um, and notice we have a good amount of cash on hand. We still have $70,000 cash on hand. And it's a uh, hundred and we're up to 136,000. That's from 50 though. So, you know, we have more cash now, 70,000 than the 50,000 we started with. And plus we have $65,000 worth of positions. So, you know, it's doing very well. But the thing is, it's just, you know, you don't have to mess around with the portfolio constantly to make really good money. This is a fantastic return. It's an average, it's 80% a year basically uh, of a return. So you don't have to go crazy messing around with positions. And, and I'm pointing out now we have the hemp boca portfolio now, which only has four positions and it's only been a month old. Let's see how that looks. So, you know, that's one you can follow. Uh, so it, essentially it's the same. It's also $50,000 like money talk. I'm also doing every pick live. Um, and here it's the same thing. We're picking simple positions. Even though I don't have hemp poker, they have a weekly show. So, and I go on at least once a month. So it's a lot more, I'm, I'm on there a lot more. So I'm willing to take a little more of a chance with a position that I am with money talk. With money talk, since I can only go on once a quarter, I have to really sit there and think about the whole quarter in advance on each position to decide where we're gonna, how we're gonna look. All right, but Hemboka, not so much. Hemboka, I could come on any time, any, any week I want, I could go on the show and or tell them what to do, or tell them what to change or something. Um, because we we are uh, Phil Stark uh, PSW Investments owns uh, a piece of Hemp Boca. We invested in them, uh, so you know we're pretty close to those guys, and we can come on their radio show whenever we want. Um. Anyway, so the, so, so you know we're doing a portfolio here because it's it's super pop. BNN it's it's incredibly popular what we do. Um. I, and why wouldn't it be? We're making a we're making them a fortune. So I want to do the same thing for the Hemp Boca guys. So we're setting up a small portfolio. And it's the same thing because I'm not being aggressive. IMAX is at $21, and the spread we set up for IMAX is targeting $21 in January. So all, all it needs to do is not go down, and we win. And that's the beauty of premium decay. We sell the $21 calls, which are out of the money, for $178. That's $1,700 in premium there. And we sell the $20 puts for $1,750 in premium. That's $3,500, $3,600 in premium sold against $4,200 long calls. So the net on the spread is about 600 bucks. And we own 10, 17 calls for 600 bucks, 60 cents each. So technically anything over 1760, ignoring the short puts is profit. And we started the spread with IMAX at 20 bucks. So it's already $4,000 in the money and we bought the spread for 600 bucks. That's crazy, but that's that's what you can do with auctions. And so, um, and obviously we don't always do that in the options opportunity portfolio, which we change all the time, or in the LTP, which we change all the time. We don't do that. We go for much more aggressive positions because we can constantly adjust and change them. But if I can't constantly adjust and change, I'm going to aim for a more conservative gain uh, that I that I don't have to worry about. I don't have to run back and check all the time. So Macy's again, I think is ridiculously cheap. But what do we do? We take a fairly conservative play. We're looking at twenty five. It's at twenty two now. And the, and this spreads all oh, both all these spreads. I mean, look, the whole portfolio is at one percent. So all these spreads are good, brand new. Um, and the NJ ETF, the marijuana ETF, also again dead flat. Um, it's at 30 and we pick up the 25, 35 spread. So it's half in the money. It's $5,000 in the money. And this is 58, 6, 9, 1,500 bucks. So we're paying $1,500 for a $10,000 spread. That's $5,000 in the money. Okay, let's try that again. We pay $1,500 
for a $10,000 spread, $8,500 upside potential, and the spread is 5,000 in the money. So if it stays dead flat from here, we're gonna make $3,500. That's if it's flat. The only way we can lose is if it goes lower. That's a conservative spread. I mean, obviously we like the stock and it's an ETF in this case, but we like the stock and we wouldn't be doing it in the first place. But you don't even have to, and, and, and people ask me this in chat a lot. They say, oh, well, you know, should we be more aggressive or can we do this or that? I'm like, why do I have to be more aggressive when I can make $8,500 on $1,500, which is what, uh, 85 divided by 15, 566%. So <clears throat> this trade can make 566% starting out at $5,000 in the money, starting out 200% in the money. So why do I have to be more aggressive than that? I would rather, you know, and again, it goes back to consistency and, and the thing we talked about, about compounding your portfolio. I would rather make less money more often because the money compounds. And this is something people don't get. <clears throat> Having the occasional big winner and the occasional big loser <laughs> is not as profitable as consistently having small winners because the small winners compound and compound and compound and grow over time. <clears throat> You know, so, 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 especially, so if I have a portfolio and I want to be uh, more cautious on it, I'm going to go for these kind of trades. You'll notice that pattern in my trading, also the same in the Hemboka portfolio as the uh, Money Swap portfolio, that I'm going to the more conservative spreads. I'm not being super aggressive. I'm selling very few puts in, in, in you know, usually half of what my commitment is or less. Here, we're only selling five puts against 15 calls. I'm, I'm, I don't want to have a lot of margin issue. I don't want to have a lot of risk. I just want to make my 30, 40, 50% a year and I will be thrilled. And again, oh, wait, start the compound rate calculation last time. <clears throat> I start out with $100,000 and I put nothing else in. I give it 20 years. And if I make 30% consistently every year, if I make 30%, Two million bucks. Oh, I'm sorry, that's ten thousand. Sorry, that's only ten thousand dollars. If I have a hundred thousand dollars, nineteen million dollars. <throat> that's in twenty years if you consistently make thirty percent. So that that's more money than anybody makes. How many people turn $100,000 into $19 million? When do you hear these stories? All right, why? Because you can't actually do it every single year consistently. You're gonna have a couple of years where you have downs and whatever, but that's what you wanna aim for. And it's easier to do that. And, and I'll tell you honestly, the, uh, the butterfly portfolio, I think basically achieves this. I don't think we've ever had a losing year in the butterfly portfolio. So we've been doing this since, uh, 2005, so like 14 years now. In those 14 years, the butterfly portfolio has has never lost. Even in even in um, 2009, 2008, it didn't lose. Um, so, you know, we it, it is possible to do this, but not every not all the time. We've had the you know the um, the options opportunity portfolio. The first year, at one point, was down 50 percent. You know, the market collapsed. Not, not this current options opportunity portfolio, the one before it, the first one we did. Um, in the first year, it, uh, it, uh, it did poorly and was down 50%. We totally recovered and all that, but, but the point is it, it can have a year, depending on where, you, where the calendar cuts off. In that case, it went down before June and was back up by December, so it never really mattered. But, you know, even having a zero year, it interrupts your flow. It interrupts that compounding flow. But you're going to make plenty of money. The point is, you're going to make plenty of money if you consistently make a small amount of money. How much is going to make you happy? Okay, obviously 19 million will make you happy. 
Or if you make 20%, then you're gonna have $4 million. Starting with $100,000, $4 million to make you very happy. Okay, make 15%, 1.6 million. Now below that, I don't think you can retire. I think less than 1.6 million makes it kind of hard to retire. But realistically, you want to make at least 15% every single year without fail. And that's, and that's what this strategy is going for, is we're going for 20 to 30% real is what we're going for. And we have a video for that. We have a video for seven steps to uh, consistent something something. <laughs> um, seven steps. to consistent, wait, consistently making, come on, it must be here somewhere. Oh, there it is. Seven steps to making 30 verbs and annual check, that's right. All right, so I have, an, I have an article on it. Seven steps to consistently making 30 to 40% annual returns. So I wrote this article and there's a video somewhere floating around for it too, but Look at this, I wrote this back in 2010. Hang on, let's see, what, what, watch this, I'm gonna be super fancy. How can I do this? Wait, where can I, where can I put my... No? How does this work? I don't know how to make a comment. Answer. Oh, okay. There we go. Oops, send to all. All right, hopefully that works for you guys. Anyway, but it's here. If you, if you, just, if you just Google seven steps to make it to consistently making uh, 30, 40% annual returns. And meanwhile, it's also a video somewhere. No, really? Well, I know it was a good video. If you go to our YouTube site, we have a whole bunch of Phil Stock World YouTube. Seven steps to consistently making. Ah, I can't believe this. Anyway, somewhere in the world there's a video of the same thing. But it's basically that article. Thirty to forty percent. Oh, that's why it's different. The secret to consistent twenty to forty percent annual returns. I wouldn't want that. Stop. Anyway, so it's a little illustrated thing. It's really the same thing. It's basically, this article turned into a video. Nine minutes. So we're really going through the whole thing here. <laughs> but this is this is literally this is what we do. This is in a nutshell how we build a portfolio. Look for low peg rates. Step two, wait for a sale. This is I say, I mean how many times do I say the same things, right? Avoid companies with huge amounts of debt. Check your fundamentals. All right. Look for look for a good story. Wait, look at the overall market, note the earnings, if they're improving, if they're not improving, track the implied volatility so that you know when it's a good time to do it. All right, it's all right here laid out. This is exactly what we look for when we're building a portfolio. So, you know, I, I, it's not that complicated. And this works. And we're doing it right now in the Tamboka portfolio, okay? We're, we're building it nice and slowly. You'll be able to see every step of the way as we go along, how we're gonna do it. And at the end of next year, when it's up 30 or 40% or, or who knows what, but next year when it's up 30 or 40%, you'll go, oh, he was right, I guess. <laughs> you know, that's, it's hard to teach because unfortunately people wait and they, I don't know what they do. It's like, I, you know, you, you know I, I do it all the time. We keep resetting these portfolios and, and doing it. One of the reasons I'm keeping the long-term portfolio and the and the options portfolio and such now is I want people to understand how this compounding works, but it's it's then I realize that you need the examples of the new ones too at the same time. Because already 
Now that the options opportunity portfolio is up 200%, everybody forgets that we once had a portfolio that was looked like the Hamboka portfolio. That's what the options opportunity portfolio used to look like. All these portfolios used to look like that. We built them one position at a time, step by step. But the problem is people come into the, to the chat room or they join up and they, and they say, oh, I want to mimic the whole portfolio right now. I'm like, that's not really how it works. It works by picking the new trades. And we constantly have new trades. And in fact, I even have the top trades with my, my uh, you know, we even have our top trade alerts right here, big thing on top of the page, fill stop trades. And you can see what I've liked recently that I thought was very good. So we have IMAX that I picked on um, the 8th of July. Oh, I bet there will be all these top trade guys are waiting for another trade, right? Apple, duh. <laughs> um, so Apple was what date? Was July 1st. So that's going to be easy to see on the chart. So Apple was here July 1st. Um, WBA was uh, late June. So down, down here, I like WBA. And um, CLF, which we're, we're, we're waiting on earnings right now, but I, that was a good one. When was this? June 14th. Oh, pretty good. Okay, so middle of June, we like CLF. That's moving up now. Um, CPRI is improving from June 13th. These are the these are the trades every week in chat. When I come up with a trade, I go, oh, that one's very, you know, the, again, it's a likelihood thing. You know, the top trades are ones I feel are highly likely to succeed. Each week when I see a trade that I think has a very strong likelihood, because it's all about that. It's not about if I like a stock or don't like a stock, or if I like a company or don't like a company. It's about how likely I think a trade is to come in the money. Because if the trade comes in the money, it's going to make money. And if the trade makes money, it's going to add to my portfolio. And anything that adds to my portfolio is a winner and helps me get to my 30 40% gains. And there's nothing I want other than to be on track to my 30 or 40% gains. Lockheed Martin, explosively higher from June 10th. Oh, that was good. Oh, I like that. We came in around here. That came, that came up nicely. But again, we're not really looking for the, for the explosions. We're just you know happy to see it. if it happens. RH, I know, did booming since then. C, we were just looking at coffee. I oh, was talking about here. Um, hogs. <laughs> what the hell are they talking about? Because oh, of the China thing. So China's driving up the price of hogs, as we expected. Um, and of course, these are the charts now. They're not the charts, obviously, from the time I was doing it. Um, do, do, do. The marijuana ETF, that hasn't been doing so good, but it hasn't been doing so good, but it had so much premium that I liked it. That was what I liked about it. Was the, oh, and again, though, this was back on May 21st. So May 21st is around here. It's actually gone down since then, but what did I do? I liked a conservative spread. Because we went conservative with our play and we sold a bunch of premium, which worked out pretty perfectly. Oh, in the butterfly portfolio, we sold a bunch of premium. So because we sold a bunch of premium in the butterfly portfolio and we, and we were very conservative here, we ended up doing quite well, even though it, it's gone down. Um, CBS, God knows how they're doing. I not paid any attention to them. Which I like, by the way. See, <laughs> by the way, I do like that. I like, I like making a pick and not worrying about it afterwards. It's like much more, for me, it's much more fun. It's like, you know, the top trades, it's like I review them once in a while. But the thing is, I don't really like tracking a trade constantly to worry about where it's going. It's like, you know, it's, it's not fun for me to sit there and, and I like to look at new stuff. I don't like to worry about the old stuff constantly. Um, anyway, when was this? This was May, I can't see because of the question box, but you guys can't see it on there. May 20th. So May 20th and we were, oh, we were nice and low. See, we were down around here. The 48 line come up nicely since then. I mean, boy, what a string of winners, huh? 
Here's a TZA hedge with, M with uh, Macy's puts to offset them. So the hedge obviously isn't doing anything. This was a July 9-11. Oh, well, it's split, so it's all messy. But anyway, so whatever happened to that. But, but the point was, it was a no-cost spread. Um, nets, it was a $750 credit. So in other words, even if the spread totally failed, then you still have, as long as Macy stays above 20, you still make 750 bucks. That's a nice, that's a nice way to hedge. Intel, May 10th. So here we have the nice pop up now. So it's moving ahead. Um, gold, obviously. Wow. Very nice on Barrick. Oh, I wasn't, sorry. I wasn't Barrick. That was gold, gold. AT&T also came back. To, that's, that's a no brainer for us. Anytime AT&T is 30 bucks, we buy it. I mean, it's, that's like just, that's almost a reflex is whenever at t hits 30, it was T3063. It's like anytime, anytime they do that, you got to buy it. Um, Gilead, chug along, you know, which is what we like it to do. It's a channel stock. Uh, FTR, ah, uh -uh, there's, look at it, my first miss. Let's go all the way back to April 30th, the one that isn't working. I'm not sure how, how wait, since April, how bad is FTR? FTR. Yeah. Yeah, it was around two bucks or whatever. Where was it? Oh no, that was late April. This is terrible. It was almost it was almost three bucks. So it's down fifty percent. I love FTR. I don't know, it's down ten percent today. <laughs> I think it's crazy undervalued, but but uh obviously uh I'm not the only one on that boat right now. Oh dear, look at oil. Is that happening now? Wow, they're really getting creamed. We didn't even look at the inventory today because um, we don't care. We're not playing it. Uh, SQQ is a hedge. CPRI, okay, also recovering. Oh, actually went down first though. CPRI April 1st. So no, that's not doing well. That went down quite a bit from here. So there's, there's a bad one. But what do we pick? We have the... 3540, 3540, now they're still off. So we'll see how they end up. Alaska Air doing well, we know that. RH, uh, well, compared to where they were, March 29th, well, they're back to where they were. They went way down, they had a really bad downturn when they came back. And BNS, we know they're doing good. Anyway, so yeah, they, I mean, that's we're only, we're almost going back a year. We've only found two that didn't work so far. Um, so anyway, that's how we build a portfolio. Okay, we just keep adding these trades. We just keep picking good stocks that are cheap, that have a good story, that have nice fundamentals, that have uh, cash flow, that aren't too badly in debt, or, you know, in the case, I'll tell you, in the case of FTR, obviously have horrific amounts of debt. And, and, and by the way, the exception, where I'm saying it's an exception, that's one I missed, right? That's not doing so well. But I like FTR because it's a telco, and telcos run on debt. They, that's what they do when they're building up. And usually they work their way out of it, all those... You know, sometimes, like um, with FTR, Windstream also, Windstream just went, Windstream actually went bankrupt. Um, there's, there are these uh, attacks that are being made on these companies, like hedge funds start attacking them, and they don't give them a chance to breathe. To breathe. You know, it used to be in the old days, you had it six months, you had a year to, like, straighten yourself out. These days, you have two bad quarters, and these guys are trying to change the board. And, then, and that causes chaos, and then things don't get paid off, and you miss loans, and deadlines don't get done, and so on and so forth, and all of a sudden, the company's like trash. It's not actually happening at FTR, but it's, it's close, because they, they just almost can't afford to do what they need to do, which is maybe have a bad quarter, but they can't afford to have to dump a quarter, uh, because they'll be immediately attacked, and everybody will lose their jobs. The whole board will get replaced, the CEO gets replaced. And uh, active shareholders take over. You know, that's happening to a lot of companies now. It's really ugly. So, 
you know, to some extent, yeah, I guess they got to start taking that into account because it's happening more and more and more that these active shareholders are effectively trashing companies. You know, and it's, and it's not just activists, they're activists obviously trying to make the company better, but they're also activists trying to just wreck a company because they take advantage of companies that are struggling, put them in an even worse situation, and they're shorting them all the way down. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not that, it's a lot, it's actually easier to destroy a company than to build a company. So, um, a lot of people are taking that path. So, CLF going to earnings this week. Uh, Bernie says, if you're bullish, I have the current position in the long term portfolio. Is there anything you would do to get a bit more aggressive into earnings? No, I don't, I'm not really big on that. Here, where's our long term portfolio? It, that's not my thing, but four earnings, I, I don't really um, like to overdo it. You know, it's like I'd rather see what happens. Mm. So here's CLF. We have the um, we have the 812 spread, and it's at 11, and we sold the $12 puts. That was a pretty aggressive sale of puts, actually. I mean, we are aggressive there because we sold the we sold these $12 puts. So my target was absolutely 12. So when we went in, when we went into this thing back in June, I was like, damn it, I think they're going to be going well over 12. Um, so and we got a long time, so it's not really important what they do now. But anyway, uh, would I want to get more aggressive? I mean, you can buy back the calls that haven't gone up that much. You can buy back some of them, maybe buy back 20 of them and, and get a little bit more aggressive um, because you're only going to take a 50 cent loss on the short call. So you're spending a thousand bucks. If you do 20, if you buy back 20, you're taking a thousand dollar loss now but you are opening yourself up for a uh for a five thousand dollar gain for each dollar clf goes over 12. but it's a gamble because if they go I, I wouldn't you know it's not my kind of gamble because i although i think they'll do well i'm going to be perfectly happy this spread is going to be twenty thousand dollars and we spent we have a 750 dollar credit on the spread so we're going to make the whole twenty thousand dollars. I'm happy with that. I don't need to mess around when I'm going to make twenty thousand dollars. It's twenty thousand dollars is good money. You know, I tell you, it's a good thing about having kids because it really grounds you a little bit. Because like you know, I, I know my kids think twenty thousand is a fortune. You know, like they just went to Europe. I gave them each a thousand bucks to go to Europe, and they were like, "Whoa, that's incredible!" You know, so. You know, they, you know, meanwhile, when I, they don't realize that when I take them to Europe, I spend much more than a thousand dollars each. So it's like, it's cheaper for me to send them to Europe and give them money than it is for me to go with them. Because if I go with them, it turns into like, you know, it turns into like a $10,000 trip. Whereas they're going and I'm, I'm, I'm giving them 2000 spending a couple of thousand to send them there. And uh, they stay with their cousin. So it's like a $4,000 trip or something like that. But, they, you know, adding me. We'd be eating in better restaurants. We'd be going to, to more places. We'd be staying in a nice hotel. So just adding me adds a fortune to the cost of the trip. Um, so so it's good to have the kids because it reminds you that like you know you you know things are you know thousand dollars is still a lot of money to a lot of people and 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 you need to ground yourself and say well you don't want to spend eight twenty thousand dollars. I go hey twenty thousand dollars. So guess like that's more money than my kids use in like a whole year. You know so that's that's really good money. Um, you know, it, it's not worth it. It's like I, you know, there'll be something else besides CLF, and and you're, and again, you're saying with CLF, you're you're saying, oh, I want to get bullish now at eleven. You know why? Get bullish at nine. Okay, don't get bullish at eleven. It's too late now. There's a channel. You can see the channel. And we're at the top of the channel. So why would you, why get bullish at the top of the channel? Get bullish at the bottom of the channel. Look for something else in your portfolio to get bullish about, not necessarily CLF. Um, and especially in terms when you have no idea what they're actually going to say. I, I think they'll break out. I mean, I do. I just said, I we just talked about, um, was it IMAX? No, it wasn't IMAX. Who came up today? Oh, Wheaton. Um, so, you know, just the other day, I said, I think they're going to break up this time. And they, and, they, and here they are. I said, was, uh, in, I, was it yesterday? <laughs> so, so, anyway, 
<laughs> I just put up a chart of this thing, and I said, I think this time they're going to make it 325. And they blasted through this morning. Um, they didn't announce anything. They didn't say anything. It's just time. It's just they, they, they've, been, they've been too low for too long, and they're going to start moving forward. And especially when you see the price of metals rising. Um, Wheat is really half gold, half silver now. They're not, they're not, they used to be pretty much all silver now. They're about 50 50. And uh, Matt asks, any thoughts on Netflix and the earnings? I think Netflix is way, 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 way overvalued, but you can't bet against them. Um, it's like Costco, uh, they make their money off these memberships. Everybody's got memberships, nobody's canceling them. It's really not enough money to cancel. It's hard to, you know, my kids have, I don't know if they cost money. So they have Spotify, we have Apple Music, I know costs money. I have Tidal, that costs money. Um, we have Hulu and Netflix. Uh, we have Amazon Prime, so you have to count that because it costs money, um, even though we really have Amazon Prime for the packages. Um, so, and then of course we've got, we still have the cable. You know, so so what we're spending so for freaking entertainment, and you say, well, shouldn't you cut one? And it's like, you know, yeah, you should, but for fifteen dollars a month, am I going to not have Hulu, or for fifteen dollars a month, am I going to not have um, Netflix? It, it, it's not really something that's going to be at the top of your list of things to cut down on. Um, you know, obviously, it's money. Money is money. Um, but I, I just don't see the, I, I'm not seeing that in their customer base. Now, where I think Netflix gets in trouble, though, is their production costs. And in fact, they're letting go of um, Friends and I think Seinfeld, I want to say, or uh, something people watch over and over. It might be Seinfeld. Um, definitely Friends. There are two series on Netflix that are, that are super popular that they're losing. And, they, and, and why are they losing them? Because, they, because the, the uh, company that owns them, <coughs> which is NBC, uh, which is Comcast, they, they've got their own streaming service that they're doing, and they're moving into that. And CBS now has all access. So all these companies will, are trying to set up their own thing. I do not have CBS all access. I'm very proud of that. Even though, even though I love Star Trek Discovery, and even though it's really hard to watch, I'm, I refuse to pay for another freaking channel. Um, but the only the only thing on CBS All Access is Star Trek Discovery. Although I think they're making a, a Picard series, which I think is going to be on CBS too. And uh, and I it's I, I just won't do it. I can't. I'm not going to sit there and subscribe just because you have one show. Ridiculous. Um, but anyway. Uh, so, so Netflix is a production company, effectively. Every all these guys are production companies. But the thing is, Netflix is a production company that's getting a hundred times earnings, whereas Time Warner is a production company that gets fifteen times earnings. Or now, now Time Warner is eighteen too. Um, so, the thing is, there's no reason, there's no logical reason that Netflix should have uh, ten times more multiple than Time Warner or CBS or NBC Universal Comcast. You know, all these guys have a normal, there's a, there's a certain multiple you give to a production company that you can't make that much money when you're producing all these shows. Shows are expensive, so not all of them are hits. Netflix is even weirder though, because they don't really give out ratings, so you don't know whether they have hits and flops. See, with CBS, they put out 10 shows, and you can see exactly how much dollars CBS is generating in ad revenue from each show. It's a fact. It's a number. Nielsen tracks the stuff. They have. There's a advertising each has charts and graphs and blah, blah, blah. And they have the upfronts, and everybody knows everyone's business out there. With Netflix, no, you don't know. Netflix doesn't even tell you what their view accounts are for shows. There's no ratings. There's no one telling anyone anything. You have no freaking idea what's happening in Netflix. Okay, all you do know is that everybody is watching Friends on Netflix and everybody's watching Seinfeld on Netflix or whatever. And those are their, those are a couple of their top shows. Now, is losing that? Here's the question: Will losing Friends and Seinfeld be bad for Netflix? Will people actually say, "Oh, if I can't watch Friends, I'm not going to have Netflix anymore"? Um. I, 
I don't ever specifically. I don't see. It's funny because I don't watch Netflix. I don't watch Seinfeld. I watch Seinfeld if it's on. I'll watch it. Big Bang Theory is on. I'll watch it, even if it's a repeat. Um, but only if it happens to be like on the TV guide and I've already looked at a bunch of stuff and didn't like anything, then I put it on. I usually go back to work. Like if it's fine code or something like that, it's like I've seen it ten times, so I just like I like it the background. It's like a it's like a song practically, you know, at a certain point. Um, so the question on Netflix though is what happens to them? when they don't have these popular shows because it costs more money for them to buy friends than it costs them to produce 10, 15 shows. So they'd rather produce their own shows and hope because that gets their residuals. If, you, you know, if Netflix pays $50 million for friends, they have friends for one year and then next year they gotta pay $50 million again. On the other hand, if Netflix makes 10 shows for $5 million each, and one of those shows turns out to be a hit show, then they will be able to sell that for $50 million to other people. See, down the road. So they're hoping to one day get that big hit that everybody wants to buy. They're hoping to have these giant series. I mean, Seinfeld uh, is, a, is a billionaire over this show, or, or close to it. Larry David is a billionaire over Seinfeld. A couple of guys in Seinfeld, on Seinfeld. Here, wait, Jerry Seinfeld. Jerry... Seinfeld net worth. What do we got, Cherry? A billionaire, nine hundred fifty million dollars from one. It's all he ever did. He only did the show, one show, Office. Thank you, Sandra. Hey, Sandra's right. It's the Office, not Seinfeld. Anyway, so Seinfeld. Only ever did one thing, really. He had, I mean, he's, he's, he's funny, he's, oh, you know, he's a comedian, whatever, successful. But I think he only really did Seinfeld. That's, that's what he did. He did Seinfeld and he retired. Um, and then Larry David also. Larry David obviously also accomplished career, blah, blah, blah. But basically their big success is, um, look how smart Netflix is these days, huh? Larry David, oh, only 400 million. Wow, I didn't know he had so much less than Jerry. That's interesting. So he's only got 400 million, poor bastard. But you know, th that's the kind of money in these shows. So Netflix would rather roll the dice every year, take their 50 million dollars of office money of um, uh, what's the other one? Friends, friends. So they take their 50 million dollar friends money and their 50 million dollar office money, and they buy 10 shows for five million dollars a piece that they produce themselves, and if one of them is successful, that's 20 shows actually, so it's 20 total shows, so 20 shows for $5 million a piece from those two shows not renewing, and um, if one of those shows becomes a hit, they get a billion dollars. That's worth it, right? They get, and they can gamble like that every year for 10 years, so they'll end up with 200 potential shows that could possibly make them money. And of course, they're ego, ego wise, they're going to say, well, of course, we're going to come up with something. But that's not true because um, not every network has done that. CW, for example, has never come up with a show that's been that big of a hit. Um, um, uh, they, they, they use a show, the networks that don't exist anymore have never come up with shows. There are plenty of local networks all over the country that never came up with very big, successful hit shows. Um, there, there are hundreds and hundreds of networks all over the world that have come up with successful hit shows. Um, BBC, very good at making hit shows. NBC is good at making hit shows. Uh, ABC, whatever. Um, actually, though, if you think about it, what are all the hit shows? The Office is NBC, but it also came from England. Uh, Friends, NBC. Seinfeld, NBC. So NBC is really good at this stuff. Um, So the thing is, they're, they, they're a production company, and Netflix is playing, in some respect, a longer game, trying to come up with a hit show. But what if they never can come up with a hit show? What if they don't come up with a hit show? Not so much what if they never come up with it, but what if they don't come up with it this year, next year, or the year after that? What if they have three consecutive years, which is very normal for any network that has slumps? What if they, you know, what if they have three consecutive years when this happens? And, and, um, you know, you see a lot of the same people 
cycling through a lot of these you know a lot of these shows are written by the same people produced by the same people it's a very inbred community that puts out these comedies and uh to some extent uh not you know i think comedies wear better you know they'll, they'll tend to play better over time than most things um there aren't that many people who are really funny you know, as you as you can tell from watching any any uh, those comic shows, we have like ten comedians, and most of them suck. Um, there aren't that many really funny people, and they get tied up in contracts. Um, the guy who wrote um, I forget his name, but he's really good. Um, the guy who wrote The Big Bang Theory, or, and whatever his name is, he's really good. He's uh, he, he he signs off at the end of every show. I can't remember his name. Um, you know, and like like Larry David there, who's a, a great writer. And uh, people like that, uh, Bright Kaufman Crane is one that you see all the time on comedies. Um, there's certain groups that they're right, but they end up getting locked up to the big networks, and, they, and that's what Netflix needs to get. They need to spend the money to get themselves a, a really good writing team. But what they're doing instead is they constantly go out there and they just buy a show. They're like, oh, that show sounds good, let's buy that. That show sounds good, let's buy that. That's not really how it works. Um, the way it works is somebody like Norman Lear makes a couple of mediocre shows, but the but the executive at NBC believes in him. So he makes a show for one year that fails, and he makes a show that runs for another year and fails. But then the third show he makes two years later, they're still paying Norman Lear to write shows, and and they're and they're giving him their top talent. They're feeding him the talent to go in there and then Norman Lear finally after three years of, of trying hits with his to go on the family. Then after that he writes the Jeffersons and they do this and that, blah, blah, blah. And it becomes a huge success and the network makes a fortune. But that's because they initially put up with his bad shows. Netflix doesn't do that. Netflix buys a show. And if the show fails, they're like, bye-bye. Each deal they make is a very individual deal. They're not developing anything in-house. They're not taking themselves seriously as a production company. They don't have a long range view of building a studio. And, and that's the thing, you have to realize that all these big studios were built off of, you know, <clears throat> I mean, what's, what's MGM? MGM is Metro Golden Mayor. It's like Louis B. Mayer was the guy who ran it. And these guys were dictators. And they, whatever they wanted to do, they did. If they wanted to spend money, they spent money. If they wanted to lose money, they lost money. If they liked the project, they would fund it no matter what. You know, you've got to have somebody who's willing to do that stuff. But that's really hard in corporate America. It's really hard these days when everybody has to answer to somebody. You know, I say same thing goes for the uh, the networks. They always have their programming guys, and they would be you'd have a good programming guy, and you trust them to have to just pick stuff. And even if the show had bad ratings, sometimes you would stick with it. <clears throat> you know, so Netflix likes to think that they're going to beat the system by having these metrics and these things, and they can tell the thing, the show, and so on and so forth. And so, yeah, to some extent, maybe they're right. They're very good at narrow casting. They have a lot of shows that appeal to a few people, and what Netflix's model really is is that their attitude is they're saying, we want to give you one or two shows that you don't want to let go of on Netflix. So something for everyone. In other words, something that appeals to you, but not probably anybody else, or so on and so forth, like um, Krypton. I'm watching a show called Krypton. I don't know where the show is. It's Superman, home planet Krypton, you know, science fiction show. And I like it. <laughs> You know, but I'm probably the only person who like it. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. You have to be a real, like, you know, comic book geek to care about these things. Um, they're, they're pulling in really obscure characters and doing really weird stuff. Um, but I like it. You know, it's, it's, for me, it's interesting. It's fun because it reminds me of my childhood. Um, and I don't even know what channel it's on, frankly. It just it comes up on my machine. It was recommended to me very wisely by uh, my cable company. And I said, sure, let's watch that. And I started watching it and I like it. And um, so, so I don't know if it's Netflix, it probably isn't, but I'm saying that the point is what Netflix tries to do is they try to find those shows that really appeal to you, like Star Trek Discovery on CBS, where I almost, almost feel like subscribing just to make sure I don't miss any Star Trek Discovery. I really like that one show. It almost makes it worth 15 bucks a month for me to see, one, to see one show. Uh, if it was on all year long, maybe I would, but it's only on like, you know, for a few months and then it's over. Um, 
so so the the model that Netflix has is they just want to get subscribers that they keep, and they do that by having some shows that appeal to some people, and those people like it so much. They'd rather have you like a show so much that you're willing to have Netflix just for that show, and and they just manage to do that with every segment of their audience to find a show that appeals to a certain amount of people. But they don't have the HBO Game of Thrones mentality. Oh, talk about hit makers, right? Um, they don't have that HBO Game of Thrones mentality, where they where they come up with a, a mega blockbuster super show. Um, and HBO had The Sopranos, and they had The Vampire Show, which came from the name True Blood. Um, they had Roadwalk Empire, which is very underrated, which I used to like. Um, HBO is very good at coming out with another big hit show each time. But it's a tricky game. And, and again, these companies, it's a hit and miss business. And these companies are valued at 20 times earnings at most. Netflix is 100 times earnings. So it's way overvalued. Doesn't even matter if they're good at what they do. They just valued it at, an, at, at, at a level that doesn't make any sense. So how's the market doing? Any changes? Doesn't look like it. Oh, my goodness. Poor oil. Oh, yeah, we're going to look at the inventory report. What the heck happened today? Um, here's the news. Let's see if we can find 10.30. La -da -da. La -da -da. Okay, there was a drawing crude. Oh, wow, ugly, though. That's why. Look at this. Huge building gasoline, huge building distillates. P-E-T-R control, and stats report. What? Oh, yeah, this is it. Okay, date, 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 July 12th, and today is the 17th. That seems right. <laughs> All right, so let's see what we need to dig a few guys. Plus, plus. All right, what do we got here? So we got no particular change in refinery activity. We have, uh, oh, look at that. We dropped our, oh, here's, here's one thing. We dropped uh, 300,000 barrels less a day of being shipped out. <clears throat> so there's 2 million barrels of build right there in product. 2 million. So this right here causes a 2 million barrel build in product. What's other oils? Other oils went up. Oh, that's bad. So other oils is up 6 million barrels. Distillates is up 6 million barrels. Gasoline is up 3 million barrels. That's ugly. And so overall, we are up 12 million barrels from last week. That's, that's a lot. And we're still, we're still exporting 20 million barrels. We're sending 20 million barrels out of the country, and we have a 12 million barrel bill. That's scary. But look at these prices. And, and, and so um, last year, we were at 71. Now we're at 60. And last year, we were at 286. And now we're at 277 for gasoline. All right? So yeah, lots of problems. OK, they're selling, they're selling less, and, they're, and they are um, and they're selling it for less money. So less less volume at less money, that's all bad for the for the industry. And that's why that sector is selling off right now. All right, Matt is saying in the OOP, well, that's a good thing to get to. Let's take a look at the OOP. Where are we? Home. <laughs> So today we did the options opportunity portfolio review. La da da. Are we done with this one? What was this? This was uh, money talk. Money talk. Yeah. So we're done with money talk. Oh, although I did want to make this point. <clears throat> so again, this is right on the front page of, of PSW this morning. Um, look on each spread. I do the math, and I, and, I, and I don't do this with the big portfolios because it's just too, it's too much. It just takes me forever. But just to give you an idea, 
because I'm trying to explain the nuts and bolts of how this stuff works. For each spread, we know exactly how much money the spread is going to make from the point it's at now. So in other words, I take the net cost, the net price of the spread here. So if I cash it now, this would be my net. What's the potential? And that means that's what we're looking to gain. And we look and consider, are we on track to gain it? So in other words, with Wheaton, it's a 24. We need 22.50, so we got a very good chance of making 22.50. We're already at 24. And Wheaton is net 11,000, and it's an $18,000 spread. So it's well on the way. It has 57% less left to gain. Six thousand. So this 11,918 will make 57%, 6832 when it gets full when it gets to this full point, right? And that's 18 months from now. And I said not too bad if you can be satisfied with 57% in 18 months and the trade's 10% of the money right now. I mean, this is a trade that would make most stock pickers look like a genius. They would tell you this trade, say 57% in 18 months, and be like, hey, take a bow, and that's it. And I mean, I in fact I, I just subscribed, I don't want to bad mouth anybody, but I just uh did a test subscription on Seeking Alpha to the one of the, to one of their top guys, and literally this would be his trade of the year. I mean, he's, he's, it's so funny what the what these guys put up with, you know. And, and you know, again, it's like it's 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 not hard to pick good trades like this using options. It's it's so much more sensible way to trade because you're using the spreads to your advantage, and all we're doing is selling the seventeen fifty puts. So my worst case scenario here is that if Wheaton Precious Metals is below 17.50, I'll own a thousand shares at that price. Meanwhile, we have the $15 calls that are drastically in the money, that are $10 in the money. We have the 22.50 short calls that are in the money now by 10%. We paid uh, 10 minus 7.5, so we paid $2,500 total for the spread. And it's 25 times 750, which is eight, well, 18,750. So it's the potential here is $18,750 on a spread we paid $2,500 for originally. It's already at 11,009. So it's up three times in since uh, October. So not even nine months. It's up 300% already. And it's going to make another. 6,000, which is actually another 200% from our original, but it's up only, only, it's only 60% of what we have left. That's what matters. And what matters is what we have left because it goes back to the question is making 57% in 18 months the best use of our, of our $11,000 now? And, and the answer, honestly, is no. We can do much, much better than that. He's going to make 2,000%. He's going to make 200%, 500%. Uh, I didn't do the math on that one, but he's going to make a lot of money. He's going to make 173. Those, realistically, those are the ones you want to put money on. But the, you have to mitigate that with the idea that uh, Wheaton's already in the money. It's a very sure thing, and also it's diversifying us. So, they, so you know, there's, there's other reasons to be in a trade other than just is it going to make the most possible money? Because none of these are guaranteed. They could all lose, but this is how much we think they're going to make if they keep going well. And how much is that, though? In this portfolio, it's going to make $117,000 in 18 months. Min I'm sorry, minus the um, hedge. So there's a hedge of 6000 And that's off 135 So it's going to make about 80%. Did I say that anywhere? Nope. Anyway, it's going to make about 80% in 18 months. But you've got to do this in your portfolios. You've got to know exactly how much money you're supposed to make, how much money you are going to lose on your hedges, how much your hedge offsets potential losses on this side, and every single position, are you on track or are you not on track? Is it doing what you thought it would do? You know, the, the thing is, I want to be cashing out positions, but these are all, we've already done cash outs. And the positions we have left are all the ones that we felt were the, were, were the most likely to win. They're all the positions that we felt were not likely to go down very much. So everything that's left in our portfolios now, after a year and a half, are, are generally positions we really, really like. 
And it's very hard to, to continue to purge because we went through a couple of purges already. And, um, and again, this is, uh, you know, this is why I wanted to keep these portfolios running is to illustrate the strategy over the longer period of time because people don't appreciate that concept. <clears throat> that as these, as these positions mature for us, they get safer and safer and safer because they're deeper and deeper in the money. And we don't even have to bother really hedging them at a certain point. Like, like Wheaton, unless, unless Wheaton drops 10%, we're 100% in the money. It has to drop more than 10% for us not to make our full $18,000. Forget losing, losing is like almost off the table. This is a really a question of whether or not we make our full, our full $18,750. Am I worried about that? No, I'm not even really worried about that. It's just within our target range and it's just now breaking up. We, and, and, and by the way, I say $18,750, but, oh, I'm sorry, it is on this one. In the long, you know, I, sometimes I say these numbers, they're conservative because if we're only partly covered, obviously you can make a lot more. Generally, in the options opportunity portfolio, we're more conservative. Oh, this is Money Talk. In Money Talk and the OOP, we tend to be more conservative. There aren't many things that aren't covered. But in, uh, in the LTP, though, I'll say the same thing. I'll say, oh, we can make this much, but that's not even accounting for the fact that part of it's uncovered, so it could actually go much higher if the thing takes off. But, but I don't need something to take off. We just had a conversation about that with CLF. CLF's coming into earnings this week, and we we have a fairly conservative position now. It wasn't when we started. When we started, it seemed ambitious to say 12 bucks. Now we're coming up to 12 bucks and it looks conservative and we're gonna have earnings and everything looks good for them. They might pop on earnings. So should we uncover it? Should we do something else? And I'm like, no. It's a $20,000 spread. It's gonna pay us $20,000. We're gonna make a fortune. It's like, it costs us $2,000 to enter it. We're making like 19 times our money back. Well, you know, not, not 19, nine, nine times our money back. So we can nine times our money back. <laughs> Why do I need to change that? Can't you you got to be, you got to learn to be happy with these things. And then that goes for 57% too. It's like, yeah, this one's going to make 2000%. This one's going to make this percent. But 57% is nice also. Every single position can't be a huge home run or shouldn't be. You got to take the singles and take the doubles. Don't. Everything doesn't have to be a home run, okay? It's more important to be safe and to know that you're gonna make your money. This one, GIS, says, yes, it's pretty much done. And, and again, we don't, I don't, we have tons of cash. We have half cash in this portfolio. I don't have anything better to do with the money. And this is money to work anyway. I can't even take it off the table. At the next, in August though, I'm almost certainly gonna take this off the table because what are you gonna do with this position? I'd rather have $9,000 cash than wait to collect $1,800 more. That's too little. 50-something percent is a good amount of money. 20%, no, I can definitely do better than that. And, 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 and uh, do I immediately have something better to do with it? No, but you know what? I'd rather have the cash and be ready to pull the trigger. I would rather have it liquid sitting there in my portfolio. It's the one thing. If I take this spread off the table, it increases my hedge. Without me paying more money to my hedge, I'm increasing my hedge because I take something off the table, it no longer has to protect. So now the same hedge is protecting a smaller amount of long positions. That's valuable too. All right, so we're gonna talk about the OOP. Okay, so here's the OOP. We were at 200% a few months ago, then, then the market turned south and we went below it and now we finally got back up, but we really popped over all of a sudden. Now we're at like 230%. Um, that's kind of crazy. Let's see, I, but like I said though, I don't trust those intraday numbers. So let's see where we are now. No, nope, still 236%. All right. So it isn't changing. Um, I, I, it's crazy. It's just crazy how much money we gained in, the, in, in since the last, uh, since just about a month. Um, about $30,000 up in a month. And um, so we were just below 200% before now. We're at now we're 236%. Um, Matt saying in the OOP, you rolled Apple. So in Apple we had... 
we have, well, we don't have it anymore. Oh, wait, no, we do. I'm sorry, we do. We have the 160, the 2021 June, 160, 2021 June, 220. So 20 long, 20 short bull call spread. We had 10 short July calls and five short puts. And basically, we kind of took down the entire position and started a new one. Um, so he's saying, would I roll up a 2020 155, 185 spread before earnings and a 140, 170 spread? Yes, yes, it's the same thing. They're, 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 they're in the money. The thing is, when you have a really low call, now, 170, you know, the thing about yours is they're both so low, like you're, you have a 155, 185 spread, and you have a 140, 170 spread. 185 and 170 are your top, so your short calls. Those are so far below where we are now, that it's very unlikely you're not going to collect the full amount. So the question is, should you wait six months for the 2020 155, 185? And um, I don't want to think this one up right now, so I'm going to get into it. Um, but, you know, let, let's say this spread is a $30 spread. And let's say right now you can cash it out for $24, all right? Or $22 even. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. The point is, how much, how much of that are you getting? It should be actually more, it should be more than 24. But let's say you got 24. So you're going to wait. The 24 for six months is only going to make six more dollars. <clears throat> okay? So you're going to make uh, one quarter. You're going to make 25% in six months. That's not bad. But you can take that same money and put it into um, what was the uh, spread that we used? So what we did with Apple, if I can find it, we effectively took it down um, and we picked up the 160 20 spread, which is $33. I'm sorry, we sold the 160 spread for $33. Um, and, and the, you know, because the 160 is a capable, well, in this case, the 160 is a capable of losing money. But the point is, I don't want to lose any money. If Apple goes down, why should I have such a deep in the money position? If I have instead the 200 240 spread, that's a $15 spread. So it's cost me a lot less money for the spread. It's also in the money now. So if you know what's your, you know, what what are you worried about? You're worried Apple's gonna go up, right? If Apple goes up, you're gonna miss something, right? That's what you're worried about. So I'm not gonna miss anything if I have the what the 200 240 spread. <coughs> And I can buy more of those. So I have 20 of these. I'm buying 30 of these. So I'm buying more of those. I have just as good of upside as I had before, except now I've taken half my cash off the table. And more to the point, though, if Apple goes down $20 and you've got the 155, 185 spread, right? It's not going to help you at all. You can't do anything or just anything or anything else. There's nothing you can do but sit on that spread. If on the other hand, though, I have this spread and I've taken half my money off the table and I've got this spread, the 200, 240 spread, and Apple goes down $20, I can then roll my 200s down to the 180s for $10. So I'm going to buy $20 in strike for, for half that money. And again, I'll be in the same position as you. Now I'm suddenly in a much wider spread, which I still believe in just the same. I mean, and again, unless Apple goes down for some reason, where I go, oh my God, it's over for them, whatever. I'm thinking if Apple goes down just because people are disappointed or, or some silly thing, um, then, then our reflex is going to be buy more Apple with the improved our position. Putting the cash on the side makes it possible for us to improve the position. If, on the other hand, Apple was blasting higher, well, then fine. <laughs> it goes blasting higher, and we're going to make the money on the spread. And it's the same. We're taking a $120,000 spread that we have $49,000 invested in. Okay, well, that, that's a net net. We're taking uh, we're taking twenty one thousand off the table, and we still have one hundred twenty thousand dollars.
All right, the only difference is that the strike now, instead of being 220, is now 240. So we've raised the strike, but we've also pushed the, uh, oh no, we haven't pushed it back, I'm sorry, it was already June. So, you know, we have two years to get to that number. I think Apple's gonna hit 240 in two years. So it's within the range anyway. 220 was initially conservative, we're now past that. And 240 is only 20% up from where it is now in two years. And Apple's gonna gain 10% a year for the next two years. I think that's very likely. But, and, and another thing is I'm in a better position now because I have, um, I have a higher, wider spread. I'm in a better position to sell short calls. And that has to be taken into account too. So in other words, here I'm selling seven short September 200 calls. <clears throat> I got 30 longs. So um, I have 30 longs, so I'm not really worried about getting buried by the seven short September calls. So if they go up, God bless them, I'm just going to roll them and roll them and roll them. And, if, and worst comes to worst, I made my $120,000. Um, if, on the other hand, any time that those short calls expire worthless, I make $7,500. Um, let's say that's three months. That's one quarter. I have six quarters to sell. That's one of them. I sell that quarter, $7,500. I have five more quarters, $35,000 more dollars I can make selling short calls while I'm waiting for my spread to come in. So either it gets to 240 and I make my 120, or it doesn't get to 240 and I'm going to get $30,000 plus some part of the 120 of whatever of whatever I decide to pull a plug on that spread. And either way, I took my 20 off the table now, so it's very hard for me to lose money on this position. And I've got money to improve the position if it goes down. So don't I feel better about that than sitting with my fingers crossed on the on these low in the money spreads? I want to be flexible. That's what's important. It's important to, especially in the earnings when you're not sure of the outcome. I'm not sure whether Apple goes up or down 10% on these earnings. Could go up or down 20% on these earnings. I really can't tell you it won't go down 20%. I can't tell you it won't go up 20%. So I want to be in a cheaper, flexible position that's going to allow me to take advantage of a dip if I think it's important to take advantage of a dip. Or if it goes up, I'm still going to make some money. It's very hard for this position to hurt me. Okay, it's also it's not easy for the other position to hurt you, but I can't do anything with it. My hands are tied. If Apple goes up, I can't do anything with the position other than cash in. If Apple goes down, I, I, I can cash it in, but I might now get less than I would have gotten because the short caller is going to be worth, have more premium than, than the long caller. And then I won't be in as good a position to roll. And the same thing goes if Apple goes up. If Apple goes up, I won't be in a position to roll because you know, if Apple goes up 20 bucks and you end up cashing your spread, then what are you going to do? Because now you're going to have to pay a lot more money for the same spread that I pay. If Apple goes down, fine, but if Apple goes down, you're gonna be stuck waiting on your spread. You still won't be able to take advantage of it. I'm taking advantage. I'm positioning myself to take advantage. That's why I'm doing this. Okay, maybe I won't, maybe it'll be flat. If it's flat, that's perfect for me because I make my money, make my extra 35. If, um, if it's up a little or down a little, make my extra 35. If it's, if it's, only, if it's down 20%, I'm actually, would, I almost would prefer it to be down because I would rather roll down to a wider Apple spread where I make another $60,000 at 240 and, and, and then can sell more puts and calls and so on and so forth. There's nothing bad to me about Apple going down 20%. If it goes down 40 bucks to 160, I will be thrilled. You would be crying because your spreads would be crushed. But if Apple goes down 160 from my position, I'm going to be excited to, to put my money back in and have a better position again. So that, that's the difference. I want that. I want to assure my future. And I'm, I'm, taking the one, I'm taking the path that has more positive outcomes, basically. Um, Wayne says, hi, Phil. What's your natural gas outlook for the summer given the increasing amount of hurricane heat events? <clears throat> Oh yeah, that's what we're betting on. We're betting uh, the reason we have that UNG spread is um, we think eventually there'll be some events that, that cause uh, the LNG terminals. It's interesting, the LNG terminals are in the Gulf. 
You know, so a lot of the LNG that's being sent out now is in the Gulf. Now, the problem is, though, that if the LNG shuts down and the production in the, in the country doesn't shut down, then there'll still be a glut of natural gas because we can't ship it out. We really need – it's interesting because it's kind of like um, – if it interrupts shipping, it's a problem. But I think um, the incredible capacity of these ships to take natural gas out of the country is probably uh, it. It won't. It won't. Um, it won't get interrupted for long. So there may be an initial build in natural gas, which we could take advantage of, um, and it might dip. Even though there's a storm, in other words, natural gas can still go lower <laughs> because the gas that's made created in the U.S. is being created in like Pennsylvania and Texas and stuff. It might not get hit by a storm, so they're still going to produce it, but they can't ship it out, so it's going to back up in the pipelines and we'll have a glut. But the ships that don't pick up in the Gulf are going to just come faster and come one behind the other and pick up more gas later, so it'll, it'll fix itself. Um, I think the key... I mean, it, but but one, what I'm trying to say is there's not as big an effect these days of the Gulf being shut down. The Gulf used to produce most of our natural gas, now it produces like maybe a third of our natural gas, and the shale stuff produces most of the natural gas. So um, uh, it's not that as disruptive as it used to be, but still, disruptions during hurricane season, the slowdown in natural gas production, so on and so forth, it's much more likely to happen this year than it was before. And uh, also, the, the real bet on natural gas, though, is just the constant addition of more and more LNG export ships. There's more terminals being built, more ships going out, and the more they do that, the more of a draw there is on the U.S. natural gas production. And over time, that will raise prices consistently. It, we, you know, we're short of seeing it now, but that's because, first, they, they are... It's faster to build the capacity in the shale. It's faster to put wells down on the shale to drill natural gas in anticipation of supplying the LNG terminal, which is what they've been doing, that project is done right away. It's very easy to produce natural gas and, and put wells up. The hard part is shipping it out. That takes a long time to build these terminals and, and push the stuff out. So <clears throat> first you have a flood, then you have demand. And, and also, you know, you've got the trade war issue with China. If we have the agreement with China, one of the things China said they would do is buy our natural gas. Why? Because they don't give a crap where they buy their natural gas. All right, right now they're buying it from whoever, Qatar, whatever. They're buying natural gas. If they stop buying it from Qatar and buy it from us, it's the same to them. They still get a shit comes in with natural gas. They do not give a crap about where they buy their natural gas. But if it makes Donald Trump happy that he gets to put a little check in his book that says, oh, look, China's buying our natural gas, great. So if we ever resolve the trade war, that's going to help too. There's a lot of, so in other words, there's a lot of ways natural gas can go up. Is it going up? No, not at all. It's in fact a total disaster. Um, we went long yesterday when it hit this line, and now and we, we, we had a nice little bump. And now it's back on this line, but, but I don't like the way it looks right now. So I'm not, I wouldn't press it. Um, but weekly, I mean, look where we are. We are, you know, we, we are way down there. And monthly, I mean, you know, this is a good line. All right, this is the two, uh, what the hell line is this? $2 line. Well, this is a $2 line. The $2 line has really held up for decades. It is, you know, I mean, held up, like obviously you have to ride this out, but it's held up generally for decades. If we are down to $2, I want to be long. That's where we are now. So we have long UNGs because we think in the course of two years, and do we have a two-year period where it really stayed below $2? Maybe here. I'm not, not below, but, you know, two years, two years where we really never got a bump. Oh, you say you never got a bump? This is almost three bucks. This is definitely three bucks. So we got a 50% move up, but it just doesn't look like much here on this chart. But but yeah, it does move up a little bit. So we get some kind of bump. But so there's one two-year period here where you could say you probably you wouldn't have had a good time, right? And not here, not here, not here, not here. Here is fantastic. 
here it's pretty good it comes all the way up to four and here you know we got that spiky thing there so you, you know you can't see a place where two dollars held at the lows it's not likely to hold again but but it's a two-year trade you know and that's why we kind of that's why we have we, we haven't been playing um <laughs> we haven't been playing the natural gas um positions lately ng's um because of this because it could we could actually hit or break two dollars but if we do we'll start playing ng again long but we are are playing ung and we're happy to add more to that position if and when uh we uh trade lower and what which portfolio is this da, 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 is this the oop and then the oop we have it but look it's a very small position you know we're, we're not you know and we're actually down on it if we do bottom out in natural gas we're going to uh roll this thing wait did we already do that what is this i think i already did that this is the oop and what did i do with it with ung i think we did i think we did make that call today there it is yeah okay so <clears throat> Waiting on hurricane season, but we made it through a world of 20, the 10 January 20 calls to the 2021. So we're giving ourselves more time. And those are four. So we were spending two more dollars to buy another year. But we also bought a dollar in better position. And we sold 10 of the uh, 25 calls to cover. <clears throat> so now we're half covered. And uh, and in two eight or in two oh two one, so we have covered. We spent a net of thirty eight hundred and fifty dollars to double the size of our position, and we're just hoping for that one good spike. Because if we get a fifty percent move, it's going to go up ten dollars, and our um, our nineteen dollar calls will be will be up at eleven bucks, and we'll make a two hundred percent profit. So that's what we're looking for. That's our potential. But we want to make maintain a position. So in this case, we're buying more time and we're buying more position as we as we roll along. But we're, you know, when there's a big spike and we make a good amount of money, we're gonna be out of there. Because you never know if it's gonna last. It often doesn't. But I, I just think the conditions are right where we should at some point get some kind of move higher. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna wrap this thing up. If anybody has any other questions, speak now forever, hold your peace. Um, we were talking about the options opportunity portfolio. So we did a whole review here. We reviewed every position. And I don't know if anything was really exciting. Uh, let's see. I, I really didn't, you know, again, I'm very skeptical on the market right now. So I didn't really put up anything that was great for a new trade. Um, the OOP is very mature now. And uh, it's just a, it's just this crushing money machine. I mean, all these uh, trades. And you know, yeah, it's not exempt from having bad trades. We lost money here. We lost money here. We lost money here. We lost, that's a hedge. That's an account. We lost money here. You know, there's plenty of places we're losing money, but they're offset by plenty of places we're winning money. So we will see. Uh, I can't believe Walgreens is this low. And I, I'm tempted, again, I'm tempted to get much more aggressive, but I almost want to cash out the whole portfolio. So it's hard for me to like really get enthusiastic about adding to positions. Apple, we reposition more conservatively and put cash. On. Again, the theme of this thing is putting cash back in our pockets for the most part. Um, DXD, we added a little bit to the hedge because we got to protect the $30,000 we just made. Gold, we a huge winner. GNC, we brought back some some little things. Um, so how are you? And UNG, we just talked about. That's it. Those are all the changes. So not a lot of changes. Now I got to do the uh, short term portfolio review. Um, let's see where we are with that. Now we got we made the money. Six twenty is not bad, actually. You know, we made the money in the short term portfolio. And it's funny, I think it's funny to say six twenty is not bad. Um, you know, we, we were up fifty thousand more, I think, in the short term portfolio at some point. Um, the short term portfolio is up six hundred and twenty-eight percent. 
It's because we gamble in the short-term portfolio very heavily, and we've, we've had a lot of good bets. Um, Netflix shorts happen to be one of the things that made a lot of money on this year in the, in the short-term portfolio, but we did it when the timing was just exactly right, where we thought it was a good time to do it. Um, mostly, though, what we gamble is, is we'll get very, very aggressive on our hedges right when we think it's the top, and we are right now very aggressive on our hedges. I'm very pleased that we only dropped to 628, uh, which is probably, I think it might've been six, we, we might be down $30,000 since the last portfolio. That's nothing, because the long-term portfolio gained way more than that, um, which is what the short-term portfolio protects. And um, uh, we're in pretty good shape. I don't think, we, I'm not very worried about that. We have very aggressive hedges, 200 calls, only 50 shorts. Um, TNA also unbalanced uh, to the downside. DXD 200 longs, only 100 shorts. Uh, SDS 100 longs, 50 shorts. Oh no, I'm sorry, it's two, two rounds, so that's fully covered. <coughs> DXD 200 and 100. I think we said that already. So we have a lot of very aggressive hedges here. Now, if I'm right and we have a 10% dip in the market, these hedges will make like. $200,000, $300,000. That's why we have so much money in this portfolio. That's what's happened several times in the course of a couple of years we've been running it, is we have these dips, we make the $250,000, and then we cash them out. And, and you say, well, well, if you cash them out, what happens if the market dips further? Well, first of all, we have the cash, and we can afford to, we use the cash, uh, to, we're already ready to use the cash to buy more, uh, uh, calls in the long-term portfolio if we have to, but also we can just buy more hedges. You don't have to be perfect. So what we what we did at most of these dips is we cashed out like a, as we did 10%, we would cash out like a third. And then when we drop further than 10%, we would cash out another another third. And, by, and then when the market starts turning, we would cash out a final third. When we start going up and retracing the bounce, we would cash out the final third and we would make a fortune every time the market dips, but that's great. And then it turned out though, we never needed the money for the long-term positions because it, it always came back. The market always came back and, and, and made the long-term positions whole again. So we never needed this money to actually uh, put back in the long-term portfolio. So it's just sitting here gathering dust basically. It's just accumulating the short-term portfolio. Ridiculous amounts of money. Half a million dollars cash on hand. This was a hundred thousand dollar portfolio when we started. A hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars cash. We have two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of positions, and uh, uh, these hedges are good for about a half a million bucks if they, if they really, if the S and P drops, if the market drops twenty percent, these things will pay like half a million bucks. It's crazy. But but that's but it's grown relative to the size of the long term portfolio which is now, da, 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 let's see. So that's up 204%, that's sick. So here we started with a half a million dollars. We now have $1.5 million. We're up a million dollars in this portfolio in 18 months. We're up 200%. Um, and it's the same thing though. There's nothing different about these positions than the, the same losing, we have the same losing stupid things too. Here's Helios and Matheson, here's Northern Dynasty. We have the same dopey positions that lose this money in the long-term portfolio. Um, the biggest difference in the long-term portfolio though is we have, <coughs> we're more apt to scale in, we're more apt that when something goes lower, we buy, we buy more of it. And again, the same dips that have made us all the money in the short-term portfolio have been a benefit in the long-term portfolio because every time you have a dip, we take the cash we have, we buy more of a position, it comes back, we, we, we shorten it up a little bit. So here's FTR, look at the massive loss we have on FTR on the uh, long-term portfolio. You know, that's horrific, but you know, what can you do? That's where we are. Um, you know, losing a position doesn't stop us. This is one allocation block. And this one lost money. We lost almost the entire allocation block on that one. But we have plenty of allocation blocks here that are green. In fact, almost all of these, and there's, um, yikes, 50, 50, 50 freaking spreads. Oh, my God. So in 18 months, we put 50 positions on in, the, in, the, in these spreads, in the option spreads, and we put um, 
we have six dividend stocks that we have here, and uh, seven, that's a covered call, the same thing. And then we've got uh, 20 short puts. Wow, no wonder I'm tired. <laughs> but it's all the same thing, though. It's all the same building blocks that we have because we built the launcher portfolio the same way. We added every month, we would add a few positions. But the big difference between the long-term portfolio and the options opportunity portfolio or the, uh, the hemp Boca portfolio or the uh, money talk portfolio, it's really just the speed we added it because we had a half a million dollars in the, in the long-term portfolio to start. So we were able to quickly add things and take bigger risks up from the start. But when you only have $50,000, you start slowly. And when you only have $100,000, you start slowly. And you don't have portfolio margin, so you you sell less puts. Look at we sell in the long term portfolio. Another key to our success in the long term portfolio, we sell tons of puts. We sell a put every single month. We sell and we try to make we try every single month we try to sell a put for five thousand dollars, and that means that every single year we make sixty thousand dollars. And right now we have about $150,000 worth of puts outstanding that in 18 months, nothing is longer than 18 months, in 18 months, we will get another $150,000. Now that's off a portfolio that started at $500,000. So that's 30% in 18 months just off the short put selling. But again, that all goes back to the same thing, the seven steps to making 30 to 40% returns. And, and if you go out looking to make 30 or 40% returns, it doesn't stop you from making 200% returns. But, but the building blocks are the same. This is just the best case scenario because the market keeps going up and up. And especially for like the long-term, short-term combination, because there's nothing better for these, for these portfolios than a market that goes volatilely up. You know, it, it generally goes up, but it also has dips because the dips, the way the system works is the dips in the short-term portfolio, the hedges pay off, why? Because the higher we go, the more hedges we add because we have more to protect in the long-term portfolio. When we get a correction, we begin cashing out the initial hedges, we intend obviously to buy more, but then if it stops going down, we don't need to buy more and we keep the cash. Then in the long-term portfolio, since we know we are hedged in the short-term portfolio, we are bravely able to buy on the dips because I say, well, I'm gonna buy on the dips because the worst puts the worst and I've got all this cash we're making in the short-term portfolio, we can always transfer it in to have more cash in the long-term portfolio. Well, as I said, though, we keep recovering, so we never need to. But what happens is when the long-term portfolio, when we have a dip, we start adding to our positions. You know, a market correction is very different than a stock correction. If a market corrects, but your stock is still making $5 billion a year, then it's still a $100 billion stock, 20 times earnings. So your stock, at five, if it's making $5 billion a year and the market corrects and it's still making $5 billion a year, why should the stock have gone below $100 billion? So of course you buy more. It isn't their fault the whole market went on sale. And you've got to separate that. The difference between your stock going down because it has lower prospects going forward or your stock going down just because the whole market went down. Now, obviously, when the whole market goes down, maybe everybody's prospects are dimming going forward. You take that into account, too. But these are all the fundamentals that we have to re-examine constantly. And that's why we do these reviews every single month. You have to constantly look at all your positions, think about them, evaluate them, and figure out whether or not they make sense for going forward. And that's also why you got to know your numbers. But if you do all that, you're going to make good, consistent returns. We'll show you how to do that. And that's, again, the hemp Boca portfolio, brand new. Brand new, pay attention to it. The options, are, I'm sorry, the, the money swap portfolio is not new, but at least it's easy to follow. We never change it, so it's easy to get on new positions. Top trade alerts, we have them all the time. We went back an entire year and found two trades that didn't work. 
in top trades. I, I you know, it's, it's not hard to build a portfolio. And please ask in the chat room if you have questions, ask, talk about it. I might be in a bad mood. I might snap at you, but, but ask. I'll get to it eventually. <laughs> so, you know, ask a stupid question. That's not it's a stupid question. Or even if it's not a stupid question, I might think it's a stupid question. But either way, I'll answer it eventually. Um, you know, it's, it's um, we just, it's, you got to do it, though. You got to practice and try and build things and get used to this. And, and the most thing you got to get used to, though, is the time frames. Because, yeah, it's very boring. The hemp Boca portfolio is very boring. Oh, only made 1% in a month. First of all, people give their ITs to make 1% per month. That's number one. Okay, 1% a month is better than most hedge funds do. So that's one thing. The other thing, though, is that, that, that it compounds over time. And that's the whole point of what we're teaching you guys. It starts out at 1% a month, then it becomes 2% a month, then it becomes 3% a month, then it becomes 4% a month. We keep layering on positions, but when do we layer them on? When we're successful. When the first four positions I have are up 5%, I'll add a couple more. But if they're not up 5%, I'm going to have to decide which one I'm going to cut, and maybe I made a mistake, or maybe it's not doing what we thought. But the the more positions we have that are successful, the more we're going to put another position on. And especially once we have some successful positions, we can afford a hedge. <clears throat> once we can afford a hedge, we get braver with our longs because we're now we're covered. But it's a cycle you got to go through. And, and, and everybody wants to make all their money the first month and, the, and, and whatever. It doesn't work like that. It takes time to build these things up. So... You know, I kind of like where we're at now because we have the mature portfolios that I can show what the result is after a year and a half of doing these portfolios while also having a couple of new portfolios that we can uh, begin building. Because I'm trying to get the whole, I, I, no matter what I do, I don't seem to be able to get the whole lesson in. So we're going to try it this way for a little while. It's like the whole lesson is paying attention to the whole big picture and, and seeing it re uh, evolve over time. You know, because because we used to always close out a portfolio. You know, the old rule used to be we close out a portfolio if it was up 100 percent because you know after if it's up 100 percent then it's fine. You know, not that you have to close it, but just it wasn't worth pursuing anymore. The more important thing was to build a portfolio from scratch. But then I realized people weren't learning the real lesson, which is that you build a portfolio and it becomes bulletproof. The short-term, long-term portfolio are practically bulletproof. In the last downturn, the combination changed. The short-term portfolio went up to, to like 800,000. The long-term portfolio went down um, uh, to whatever, 1.3 million, but that was still 2.1 million, okay? Now it's 700,000, now it's 2.2 million. But the point is, when we had that great big dip, we were at 2.1, now we're up and we're at 2.2. The short-term went down, the long-term went up. But on the whole, we're plus $100,000. That's bulletproof. That's riding out the dips and making money. Why do we make money? Because we are selling monstrous amounts of premium here. We have sold so much premium in this portfolio that every single month we make a giant chunk of money. It's almost impossible for us not to make money because we, we, we've got, you know, Let's say we sold a half a million dollars worth of premium. That means every month, $50,000 worth of premium comes due. So we're going to gain $50,000 each month just based on time. So then the positions can go up or down or whatever, but we've got that $50,000 a month advantage. And $50,000 a month, when we started with a half million dollars, is 100% return for the year on premium sales. That's how we do it, but we build it over time. And as we build it over time, our positions like Apple, they get bigger and we sell more premium. You know, this original position was never, never this big, but it got bigger because we could afford more. And as we afforded more, we sold more. And now we're selling, like I said, we sell $35,000 of short-term calls against this position. That's much more money than we started the position with. It was only a hundred thousand dollar portfolio at one point. 
but we're selling cream and, and collecting these dividends, huge amounts of money in dividends. We're probably I think we're collecting like 50,000 in dividends. We're collecting 50,000 a year in dividends, $75,000 a year in short put money. That's 125,000 back on a half million dollar portfolio before we even have a trade. Not, I mean, these are trades, but before we even have a, a, any kind of real option trade that we're going after, then we do the spreads. 50, wow, no wonder I can never get this freaking portfolio done. Then we do the spreads. <laughs> And, the, and this is what's left. I mean, we've, we have cut these down and cut these down and cut these down. We just had so many good trades. And why do so many good trades? Because the market goes up and up and up and everything tends to work. It's not, you know, there's no lack of finding things that are good deals that we could stick with and they make money over time. That's why we, and, and so we end up just ending up with all these freaking positions. It's crazy. The way, way more positions than I like to have. But, you know, then I go to look to cut them, and I'm like, oh, they're all good. It's hard to cut. How do you cut these things? There's so I mean, there's not many of these things I don't like. So that's kind of crazy. But anyway, right, so uh, if you want a new portfolio, the head Boca, brand new, completely uh, ready to go. Um, and we're working on the other portfolios. We're going to see what the earnings look like, and we'll have a lot to report next week. There's a lot of big companies coming in, uh, and we'll see how everything goes, all right? So thanks, everybody, for coming, and we will do this again next week.